Good morning. How you guys doing? Yeah, you look good. <laughs> what if there was a question that you could ask that when answered brought you a sense of profound, lasting peace? This question made you feel so happy, such a great sense of safety and belonging. Now, the answer to this question made you look 10 years younger, made uh, babies and small animals love you, <laughs> and it enabled you to see God or the divine in all beings. The answer to this question enabled you to love and be loved like never before. My question took me to a Buddhist monastery, 700 of the Fortune 1000, a geisha training room, <laughs> uh, the Clinton and Bush White Houses, and the LA County Morgue. My question took me to the feet of great spiritual masters in holy places and to world leaders in gilded mansions. It also took me to the homeless in grimy gutters. And ultimately, my question took me to the homes and hospital rooms of 16 people as they died with their questions still inside of them. And this is how I realized from my work as a hospice volunteer that we all have this big, gnarly question. And you are asking yourself this question whether you know that or not. So we're going to figure out what that question is. This question, it defines you. Your question, it's why you do what you do. It drives you. What is your question? When I was seven, my dad told me I was supposed to be a boy. And as a girl, I wasn't really pretty or smart. So my question quickly sprung forward. Ooh, am I good enough? Because if I'm not good enough, what am I supposed to do with my whole life ahead of me, right? Lead some sort of inconsequential, substandard existence? So I set out with my question firmly planted in my gut, and I started to achieve. And I feel, figured if I achieved and achieved and achieved like nuts, I would have so much proof that I would know that I totally was enough. So here I stand, 41 years later, with, seriously, you guys, an excessive amount of achievements. <laughs> I look at my bio and I go, that woman must be exhausted. <laughs> and then I go, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> what is your question? See, often we think that we have to be perfect or polished to like get by in the world, to be respected and valued in the world. We think that our intellect is gonna get us through most, most of life's situations, but actually, our intellect is not in charge. Our intellect is not gonna help us find our question or our answer because our emotions are in charge. Check this out. 90% of your responses are emotional, 90%. And your emotions respond 400 times faster than your intellect does. Isn't that trippy? Yeah. So when you think about that, what do we really need to do? We need to find that big honking question that we've been asking ourselves anyway bring them to the light of day, right? And then we get the coolest quest ever. We get the quest for our answer. And once you get on that quest for your answer, something magical happens. You start to actually know what it is that you want. And when you get it, you're actually satisfied. And you get off of that loop, you know, of like wanting stuff, getting it, being eh, kind of satisfied, but then wanting more, and then getting it, and you know, that whole desire thing. It's called human existence, right? We're talking today about the next wave, right? Your next wave. Your version 25850. See, I find that we're all like software. Now I know, I was an engineer, so I'm a little geeky, but, but I've had a makeover. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we rev ourselves, right? How do we get to that next groovy version that can do more, that is more super fabulous? Well, we have to intentionally evolve. What does this mean? To intentionally evolve, we need to buck the hide who you are trend 
that humanity has celebrated for centuries, right? There are three ways I want to share with you to intentionally evolve. First, reveal yourself. Now, revealing yourself is scary. We all have masks, you know, to hide ourselves in the world and armor to protect our soft underbelly. And you can learn to reveal yourself in inches, which become feet, yards, and ultimately miles. I had the great good fortune to work with a remarkable man named Greg Woods. And Greg brought me in to the Clinton White House to define and launch the technology strategy, the intranet strategy. So all those internet applications you're enjoying right now for the consumers of America, right? We helped develop those. So what was so cool was he brought me in. I was in my 30s. I was pretty freaked out, okay? Like, oh, low profile gig, right? And <laughs> at one point, um, his, Al Gore's like, okay, so let's get everybody launched up. All the government have all internet applications launched in 90 days. I was like, okay, dude, meanwhile, back on Earth, we're dealing with mainframe programmers, okay? <laughs> with like slide rules and stuff. So we had to make these mainframe programmers into web developers. And Greg Woods, this man, he just, he just walked around just revealing himself, showing his humanity all the time. And his people, they rose up like I did not even believe was possible. This man so moved me. He changed my whole view of leadership, of management, and definitely of the government, right? And there was a time I could have told him how profound his impact was on me, but I didn't. Because I thought, oh, if I reveal myself, I'm not gonna be like, kind of like, hey, together, hip, yeah, you know? I, I thought I'd be like, you know, mushy, you know, unprofessional, you know, not worthy of being in the White House, right? So I didn't, but it really bugged me. So a few years later, I got on the phone and called him up, and he didn't answer. He had died a few months earlier from pancreatic cancer. Every moment you have an opportunity to reveal yourself or not, you have an opportunity to share your humanity or not. When you reveal yourself, you get that much closer to finding your question, or if you know it already, that much closer to finding your answer. Don't miss the opportunity, please. When did you choose to stop revealing yourself? Was it when life held you high, right, and you didn't want to be knocked off that pedestal? Or was it when you were just scrambling, trying to survive? Second, stand for yourself. Standing for yourself is an inside job. Now, in standing for ourselves, we have to look inside for the answers and not out, and I know that that's really popular to look outside. So when you feel the tug of the world trying to pull you outside to look outside for answers, it helps to have a mantra. I like, I am enough, I do enough, I have enough. I am enough, I do enough, I have enough. We have to get still. We have to find out who we are behind those 60,000 thoughts we have per day. 60,000 thoughts we have per day. And they are, check this out, 90% repetitive. <laughs> What's that about, right? <laughs> who are we behind all that wicked noise, okay? Third, we have to get still. I had an opportunity to serve the Dalai Lama recently on his tour. And um, day one, everyone was getting all these really cool tasks, gardening, greeting dignitaries. And I kept like going, pick me, you know? And um, they did pick me um, to clean, uh, to clean toilets. And there was a moment when I thought, ew, totally gross. I pay people to clean my toilets. <laughs> I kind of think I'm a little above this. And then, thank God, <laughs> I got a little still, and I got, um, no, okay, this is a great opportunity to work on ego and elitism, symptoms of not good enough. So, honey, take that comment and scrub away. Day number one, 12 hours of cleaning. Bring me your grimy toilets, I am ready. <laughs> Day two, 12 more hours. Day three, after two days of basking in humility and silence, thank God, I was placed front and center in front of 14,000 people representing the Dalai Lama. There is no way in hell I could have done that without scrubbing toilets in silence for two days, right? All good. All right. Ma is a Japanese term that loosely translated means pause. 
the pause between breaths, the pause between musical notes, the pause between thoughts. We cram our calendars and our brains full of noise in an attempt to avoid that emptiness. But emptiness is where you're going to find your question, and emptiness is where you're going to hear your answer. Here's one way to experience emptiness. Picture a TV screen in your mind, and there's a newsreel across the bottom. And there's news and a little bit of ma, emptiness, news, emptiness, and your thoughts are like news. Have you noticed there are always more? Yeah. <laughs> Infinite supply of thoughts. So let the thoughts drift by. Don't attach to them. Don't reject them. Let them drift by. Focus on the blank space. Focus on the ma. As you focus on the ma, the emptiness, it will start to expand. If you simply spend five minutes per day working on an emptiness practice within 30 days or less, you will start to hear silence. It is a remarkable sound. That is where it all makes sense and it all comes together. I first got my, my answer in my body, in my head, when I published my book in 2007. I get my answer in my heart every day as I reveal myself, as I stand for myself, and as I get still. I want to leave you with this. Take the time, make it important enough to reveal yourself, stand for yourself, and get still. One day you will die. Will your heart be heavy with your question? Or will it be light with your answer? You are a fascinating human being. You have very little time on this gorgeous and mysterious planet. Get curious about yourself. Find out who you are, and then show us. We really want to know you.